In this video, we will explain the meanings of the terms total volume and vital capacity. We'll describe how a spirometer can be used to measure vital capacity, tidal volume, breathing rate and oxygen uptake. And we'll analyse and interpret data from our spirometer. So right now, as you read this, I'm guessing you're breathing. <laughs> um, quite clearly this is important for you to stay alive. Um, and you're probably quite relaxed, so you're probably, um, you're probably sitting down. I'm guessing you're not very stressed, because when I'm stressed, I don't watch science videos on YouTube. Um, and your breath is quite slow, your breathing is quite slow. Um, and if you don't concentrate on your breathing, it should be quite natural. And this is what we call the tidal volume. So tide tends to mean drifting in and out, or up and down. For example, the sea tends to have a tide where the water levels naturally go up and down depending on the moon and the spin of the earth. So, um, as you're breathing very naturally in and out, this kind of motion I'm drawing on the, on the graph there, that's known as your tidal volume. And of course it's measured at rest. Now on average, the distance between that peak and that trough there is about um, 0 0.5 decimeters cubed uh, and I'm sure you can think about why we need to have a tidal volume um, continually if we're resting. Think about the reasons. Well, the reasons are, first of all, we need to respire even at rest because there are metabolic processes um, in our body, um, such as our liver working to filter our blood, um, urine being produced and so on. These things require energy. So energy through respiration is obtained by oxygen and glucose reacting inside your mitochondria. But also, while we're respiring, we're building up a quite a, a harmful waste product. And if you think about it, carbon dioxide is being formed by all your muscle cells, your liver cells, and so on. Um, pretty much every cell in your body is producing quite a lot of carbon dioxide. And as that accumulates, it causes your blood to change in pH. Um, and you need to try and get rid of that carbon dioxide. But on top of that, um, it's toxic in high concentrations. So... Um, tidal volume allows us to breathe out to exhale carbon dioxide and breathe in to inhale oxygen so we can still respire at rest. And if we're going to measure it with an athlete, we have to make sure they're sitting down, they're relaxed, they've not done any exerted ex uh, exercise um, and they're not stressing about anything so they shouldn't really be focusing on their breathing. And even with those procedures and protocols, sometimes you might find variations in tidal volume. You'll also notice that um, women... And men tend to have different tidal volumes, and men of different sizes or women of different sizes and lung sizes have, again, different tidal volumes. It can also be an indicator, not a diagnostic, but an indicator of disease or illness, because those who struggle breathing sometimes find um, their tidal volume differs from the norm. So tidal volume is a really important one. We're going to highlight that. That's something you have to know for the exam. Another important one is vital capacity, which is over here. And um, vital capacity is different, it's not at rest, and we see that vital capacity is being measured at this stage here. Um, and for clarity, they've shifted the arrow along so it doesn't interfere with the graph. Basically, if this person has breathed normally at rest, the person checking their breathing has quite clearly asked them to breathe out as far as possible, when they inhale again, once they've breathed out fully, they've got normal breathing, tidal volume, and suddenly the person's asked them to take a very deep breath in, which they've done, as far as they possibly can, and then once their lungs are completely inflated as far as they can go, then they've been asked to push out as much air as possible in one fast breath, continuous breath, until eventually they can breathe out no more. And then, of course, once they finally empty the lungs of all the possible air they can possibly empty in one breath, they then breathe back in again sharply because they're obviously out of breath, and then they start to breathe fairly normally again. Um, so you can try this yourself so you can remember them. So I would suggest for you to try and breathe in and out naturally, take a big deep breath out, breathe back in again, and then eventually take a sharp deep breath in all the way out and back in again. But, of course, if you've got asthma, be a bit careful about changing your breath patterns too much. And that is your vital capacity. It basically measures how much air you can move into and out of your lungs 
in one large breath. And it differs between men and women. It differs between, between athletes. So, for example, marathon, marathon runners or sprinters or table tennis players would have different vital capacities. And it differs from fitness. But on average, generally, vital capacity is about 5 decimeters uh, cubed. And it does change with fitness. So as you, as you exercise and your lungs start to become stronger and they can expand more, um, your vital capacity should, should increase. And therefore, the amount of oxygen you can kind of gain inside your lungs and absorb and utilize per breath increases too. And for athletes who work very hard, it's important for them to absorb more oxygen and therefore their body adapts by increasing their vital capacity. But your vital capacity is not the same as your, as your total lung capacity because you notice there, even if the person breathes out as much as possible, there's still some leftover air in their lungs. And if you think about it, that has to be true because... Um, it's a bit like saying, for example, take a balloon, inflate the balloon to full size, and then let go of the balloon so the air rushes out of it. The air would rush out of the balloon, and eventually the balloon would deflate, and it will be about the size of a deflated balloon, clearly. But there's still some air in the deflated balloon. You haven't squeezed it with your hand to make sure the air comes out. And for your lungs to be completely empty, you literally have to squeeze them so all the air comes out. And your muscles don't do that. And if they did do that, it would make it even harder for your lungs to reinflate again on the next breath. So we tend to have a residual volume of air, which is about 1.5 dm cubed, decimeters cubed, left over after maximum exhalation while measuring vital capacity. Now I want to point out one thing. This diagram comes from your textbook, and it's actually wrong. And you should see here that um, the inspiratory and the expiratory sorry, reserve volume should actually be switched over uh, because the inspiratory is the reserve volume is how much air you can breathe in over and above the tidal volume and the expiratory reserve volume is how much you can breathe out under the tidal volume and of course if you go to Google and type in spirometer diagram and you go to image search you'll find that all the evidence points to the alternative that I've just showed you as opposed to the textbook and this is probably because they're trying to make lots of money in a very short time without checking, unfortunately. Um, however, it's not really necessarily specifically an exam scheme, but you should know that your tidal volume is your resting breathing rate. And of course, it doesn't mean you can't breathe in even more than that. So if you, if you are normally breathing in and out, there's still some reserve um, inspiratory volume that you can take advantage of if suddenly you have to start running. And you don't want to be having tidal volume going on when you're running at, I don't know, two or three or four miles an hour or something. Now this diagram is a much more accurate diagram of a spirometer. And we see there <clears throat> the person breathing for a disposable mouthpiece which can be thrown away um, after use to maintain hygiene. And there's an inflow pipe here and it comes from this tank and the tank is airtight and it's sealed with med uh, medical grade oxygen. So there's obviously less nitrogen, argon and other gases that kind of get in the way of measuring accurately um, your respiration rate. So when you breathe in, you suck through the oxygen, which goes through the pipe, into your mouth, down your trachea, down your bronchi and so on, eventually it absorbs into your um, bloodstream through your alveoli. And then when you breathe out, you're breathing out the carbon dioxide and probably a small amount of oxygen that you haven't managed to uh, diffuse through your um, alveoli. And that gets pushed in an alternative direction by, by a mechanism which goes through this tube underneath the tank, around through this soda lime component, and eventually um, some of the remainder, remainder goes back into the uh, tank again. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, the soda lime is there um, for a really important reason. And actually, <clears throat> soda lime is an alkali, and when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, it forms an acid. So there's some sort of neutralization reaction that happens here, which is not really important to understand the biology of it, but it is the chemistry. But we'll skip over that and we'll just say that the soda lime absorbs the carbon dioxide. So actually you get four marks in the exam for saying the soda lime absorbs the carbon dioxide from your breath. So ask yourself why that's important. Well if you think about it, if the soda lime wasn't there, if your carbon dioxide went right round into the tank, oxygen comes right round into your mouth, more carbon dioxide into the tank eventually, Within a small space of time, this tank will be full of carbon dioxide and very little oxygen. 
So the percentage of carbon dioxide in proportion to oxygen would increase. And therefore your carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is 0 0.04 and really safe, might increase to maybe 0 0.4 or 4%. And then that's when it starts to become poisonous. And at 4 or 5%, you'll probably notice quite a few side effects. And eventually at 10 15%, you could die or at least be very severely ill. So you do not want someone continually breathing air um, that's being recycled and processed by their body because eventually it will build up with carbon dioxide. Um, and these people on the spirometer will probably be on a bike running or, or, or cycling for an hour and the scientists will be measuring their process over an hour. So within that hour, you want to make sure that the carbon dioxide is being removed. Um, now also, as you breathe out, you push air into the chamber and actually by pushing air into the chamber you cause the um, air to apply more pressure to this movable floating chamber lid and the, the movable floating chamber lid is plugged into a data logger and that moves up and down in the same way the lid moves up and down and the lid moves up and down in the same way that your lungs are moving in and out to push the air in and out as you breathe. And of course that produces a trace. So you can see the trace will be produced that looks a bit like this if you're measuring tidal volume. And that is how you can measure things like breathing rate, vital capacity and so on. Very accurately. So if I was to draw a graph of what a spirometer would show and I'll draw a y axis there, x axis there. On the y axis we'll write down volume per dm cubed, and I can't put the cubed in this iPad, so I'll just put a, a large 3 there, but you should know it should be a superscript number. And on the um, x-axis we're going to put time, as we're measuring the breathing in and out over time, and of course that's going to be measured in seconds, most, most likely. Um, by doing that, we can then start to really inaccurately plot someone breathing on a spirometer. And we notice that we get a pattern that looks like you saw in the previous diagram of spiratum trace. Um, that looks like this. So we, this is at rest, by the way. So we see tidal volume in and out. But you're probably wondering why my diagram is a lot more crooked than the one we saw before. You're probably thinking that maybe I'm lying down at an angle, um, and that's not true. But actually, what's happening is we see the volume in air, the net volume overall if you averaged it as a straight line, you would see it do this. So can you think about why the overall trace pattern is declining and showing a reduction in volume over time when you breathe through the spirometer on the previous diagram? Well, you should remember that all the while you're breathing in and out, you're removing a substance from your, your breath. That substance is carbon dioxide and it's removed by the soda line. And interestingly, we could say that generally, because we've got a um, respiration reaction happening in your body, the equation for respiration, the Y equation, is glucose plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide and water, which you know from case 3. But the symbol equation is C6H12O6. Hopefully, if you've done chemistry, that's fine. And if not, don't be scared. We'll learn this in another module, um, and that's glucose, and glucose plus oxygen, O2, goes to CO2 plus H2O, but that's clearly not balanced because we've got too many carbons on that side, not enough on that side, too many hydrogens on that side, not enough on that side, and hopefully, we won't bore you with the details just at this stage yet, but hopefully you should be able to work out that it's going to be 6O2 goes to 6CO2 plus 6 H2O. That means for every molecule of glucose you need 6 molecules of oxygen and then you're producing 6 molecules of carbon dioxide and 6 molecules of water. And if you do chemistry you'll also learn that on average a set quantity or a mole of gas at room temperature generally has the same volume. So what we're saying is there's a direct relationship 6 molecules of oxygen goes to 6 six molecules of carbon dioxide, it's basically a one-to-one -one relationship. So basically for every time you produce a bit of carbon dioxide, you've lost a bit of oxygen. So by measuring 
the decline in volume by measuring how much how much of the volume goes down over time we can measure how much oxygen has been used up by the athlete and you can work out which which sports for example require the most energy which sports um, cause respiration to happen the fastest because respiration can be measured indirectly you can measure how different size and strength of athletes can affect their traces and how much oxygen they use in their bodies now I want to give you some um, really random maths here I'm going to make up numbers so please don't quote these in the exam but they're just to give you an idea of how to calculate if the exam was to ask you about a calculation let's say that this point here is point A the bottom what we call the trough of the tidal volume that's when you fully broke um, when you you've breathed out fully during resting breathing and we'll say that this point over here is point B now again remember I'm, I'm making this stuff up so please don't quote the numbers but let's say point A is let's say 5 dm cubed and point B is 2.2 dm cubed so We'll also say that at start here, over here, that's obviously zero time, so also that's about 10 seconds at point A. And obviously in the, in the exam you have to read this for the graph yourself. And point B, let's say, I don't know, again I'm making it up, let's say 55 seconds. So if we're asking you to work out the consumption of oxygen per second, well, we know that the decrease in volume is due to the fact that carbon dioxide is being used up. And that's the same proportion of oxygen um, being used up because the carbon dioxide, sorry, I shouldn't say used up, the carbon dioxide is being absorbed by the soda lime and therefore it's not entering the chamber. And that's the same amount as the oxygen being um, used up by respiration. So we can work out the amount of oxygen being used per second. So pause the video and think about how you can work that out. So hopefully you've done it as follows. We can say that between 10 seconds and 55 seconds, there has been a reduction from 5 dm cubed at point A to 2.2 dm cubed at point B. So the first step is to say, well, 5 minus 2.2 equals 2.8 dm cubed. And that's how much oxygen has been used in respiration, or at least absorbed into your body, in well, between those times. And then we can say, well, what's the time difference between 10 and 55? So we can say that 55 seconds minus 10 seconds is equal to 45 seconds. So we say that there's been 2.8 decimeters cubed of oxygen used up in 45 seconds. So how would you work out how much has been used up per second? Hopefully you realize that's easy. It's simply 2.8 over 45. And that gives you 0 0.062 decimeters cubed, which I can't fit in there. And I'll put a dot there because it's reoccurring. And it's probably okay to say 0 0.06 decimeters cubed per second. So that's what we call oxygen uptake. That's how much oxygen we're taking from the um, chamber. And that's what's hopefully being absorbed by the person on the spirometer. So, hopefully we can explain the meanings of the words tidal volume and vital capacity. Um, we should also be able to describe how a spirometer can be used to measure vital capacity, tidal volume, breathing rate and oxygen uptake, which we can. And I would encourage you to try and redraw the diagram of a spirometer on your own and explain the different parts of a graph to a friend to remember that. And also we should be able to analyse and interpret data from a spirometer and that includes for example um, looking at the steepness of the graph talking about the difference in tidal volume and vital capacity and so on